About a month ago, I beat Pokemon Black for the first time using only Dark Pokemon. And, because I'm an idiot, I asked all of you wonderful people what I should do in Unova Part 2. I was hoping for another Dark run in Black 2, but overwhelmingly, you guys chose Bugs. What is wrong with you? We all know that Bug is the worst Pokemon type. Do you enjoy watching me suffer? Well, I am obligated to do what the masses desire. So, let's try to beat my first ever playthrough of Pokemon White 2 with Hardcore Nuzlocke rules using only Bug Pokemon. Boy and his best friend slash rival, Nike, trademark, start their Pokemon journey. Nike seems surprised that someone's just going to give me a Pokemon for nothing, and his sister tells me to take extra good care of it. There's probably some backstory there, but who knows. He then follows me around town until I find Bianca, who lets me pick a starter. I go with Snivy so that Nike will get the fire pick. Obviously Snivy is not a bug, but we'll get a real starter soon enough. Not Bug has his first and only real fight against Nike, and wins with no problem. After Bianca shows me how to catch a Perleon, that's right, I'm not changing the way I say it, I meet the former champion, Adler, also not changing that, who jumps off a 20 foot ledge like it's nothing. That's impressive. After he does a full circle to check me out, which is a bit weird, he blabs about some unimportant stuff. Jumping ahead a bit, I find my first real starter of the run, a seed waddle. Laif Bouget and I quickly encounter Nike, who wants to fight again, even though we just did this. Thankfully, his pig still doesn't know Ember, so I win after several tackles. While looking for a lost Pokemon, I see some pretty cute little Mareep just chillin' in the field. I find the missing Pokemon being held hostage by a Team Plasma Grunt. Right as I'm about to knock his block off, he pulls the old throw a TM and run technique. It's the oldest one in the book, so I probably should have seen that coming. I follow Adler into a school, where I promptly beat up some school kids, per his request. He then jumps off the same cliff for absolutely no reason. I swear, this guy is just flexing. I finally get to the first gym, where I challenge Charon and his normal type Pokemon. Even though I only have one Pokemon right now, Bug Bite is actually pretty strong this early in the game. His Patrat falls in two hits, as Laif Bouget, or LB for short, levels up. The Lil Pup immediately gets a crit, which isn't fair, but after a second tackle, LB is in swarm range. So, a second bug bite takes out the pup. Turns out I was Charon's first challenger, meaning he has a 100% loss rate as a gym leader. Man, he sucks. Either way, I get the basic badge from a basic man and continue my journey. Outside of the gym, I find Bianca, and it turns out that she and Charon haven't talked in two years? They're not very friendly, are they? After exchanging numbers, we have a four-way video call, even though three of us are literally standing right next to each other. In the first dark grass of the game, on Route 20, it takes a while, but I eventually find myself a Venipede, who I catch and name lots of legs, for obvious reasons. With my now team of two, I'm ready to take on the world. Or at the very least, I can destroy Leah and Lily's sun curtains. That's basically the same thing, right? In Verbank City, as soon as I enter, I find the second gym leader, Roxy, fighting with her dad about his unrealistic dreams to become a movie star. Isn't that the type of thing you generally grow out of? She then has some very choice words for this guy, but it's all PG stuff. This is Pokemon after all. Still, I head to the Rock and Roll Gym to teach Miss Potty Mouth a lesson. Her poison Pokemon are going to be a bit of a challenge. I start with Lots of Legs, who is just about to level up against her coughing. After using Defense Curl, you probably know what's coming here, I use Rollout, and just hope for the best. The coughing falls in three hits as I level up. Her last Pokemon is Whirlipede. Now this guy has Protect, so he can easily stop my Rollout, but I'm prepared to sack lots of legs if I need to. Instead, I outspeed and one-shot the Rounder Centipede. In case you didn't know, because I didn't realize before this, Venipede actually has higher base stat than Whirlipede, and that's why I went first. I still don't know why she didn't use Protect, but I'm okay with that. We ended up winning, and it was a lot easier than I had anticipated. Then, for some reason, these big shot movie producers think that I could be a movie star, but after watching the crap they create, and seeing the captain's dreams go down in flames, I decide that showbiz is not for me. So I get out of there, and after doing some more unimportant plasma stuff, take the boat to Castellia. And just like last time, 
I find these guys dealing contraband in an alley. And a guy who flashes me. But this time, there's no weirdo dancing lady. Wonder where she went. Just for fun, I decide to explore the sewers with Nike, TM, where we just so happen to find more plasma grunts. For a group that was utterly destroyed a few years ago, there are still an awful lot of these guys hanging around. While I'm still in the sewers, LB evolves, and then I find a nice little park in the center of the city. For some reason, it's only accessible through the sewers, but it is what it is. And even though I have no viable encounters here or in the sewers, I make sure to fight all the trainers and find a ton of wild Pokemon. This includes going north into the desert until LB evolves yet again. Once my Pokedex reaches 40, I get the Eviolite, an item that I'm going to use quite a bit in this run, because it's awesome. In preparation for the next gym, lots of legs evolves, but can still benefit from the Eviolite defense boost since he has one more evolution. And with that, it's time to prove once and for all who the better bug trainer is. I leave with LB, who should finish off the Swadloon in one super effective bug bite. Or not. And I get String Shot, which is not great. Because I need all the speed I can get, I swap to lots of legs on a Hyper Potion and start with a Rollout, which almost immediately misses. But with Eviolite, I'm taking basically no damage here. After almost killing with a Bug Bite, I swap back to a Defense Curl Rollout Strat and knock out the Leaf. This brings out Dwebble, who hangs on because of Sturdy, and then I miss a rollout. I swap back to LB on a smackdown, and heal with some leftovers. I need LB out now, so he can face Berg's last Pokemon. After I protect to heal just a bit more, that is. Which lets the Dweeble use Rock Polish, and outspeed me next turn. So that kinda sucks. Finally, it's time for the Leif Bouges to fight each other. I start with protect, of course, then, after stealing his berry with a bug bite, she slows me down. His struggle bug does way more than I thought it would, and I would not have survived a crit. But one last bug bite, and we win the insect badge. That, yes, actually, does suit me very well. Thanks for noticing, Berg. This gives me access to the desert resort, where I get my very own Dweeble. I name her Lil Rock, and I'll keep her underleveled for a while. You'll see why soon enough. As I leave the desert, I enter Join Avenue, where an important CEO guy automatically trusts me to run his business while he's away. That's a horrible business plan. I'm a kid here, I don't know anything about running a business or making a profit. But I didn't ask for this job, so I just leave. Eventually. It's a ridiculously long building. In Nimbasa City, I accidentally talk to the crazy metal guy, and he gives me a ton of medals. This was the first, but unfortunately, not the last time I make this mistake. I team up with some rando to beat the subway bosses, who, if you ask me, kind of overdo it with their black and whiteness. But hey, what do I know? After that, it's time to head to the gym, only to discover that to gain access to the new gym, I have to first go through the old gym. That's lame. And at the old gym, I apparently barely missed Alessa. That's fine. I need to get another encounter first anyway. And lots of legs evolves along the way. In the Lost Lorn Forest, there are three encounters I can get. Combi, who I don't want because only the females can evolve, and there's only a 1 in 8 chance of even getting a female. Vespi Queen wouldn't be bad per se, but I can only find her in Rustling Grass, and she's a flying type, so that wouldn't really help all that much for the electric type gym. No, the guy I want is Pinsir. Fortunately, in the normal grass here, Pinsir can be found two levels higher than Combi, allowing me to use Repel Manipulation to ensure an encounter. This is why I kept Little Rock a low level until now. It still takes a while, but I eventually find one and name her Big Claw. Against Alessa, I start with LB and am hoping this Emolja outspeeds me, so I use a Bug Bite. But I outspeed, unfortunately, and then get immediately paralyzed. That's just perfect. I knew she was going to Volt Switch to Zebstrika, so I wanted to steal his berry, but it didn't end up working. I swap to Little Rock with an Eviolite on a Flame Charge, who tanks it pretty well and then I steal his berry anyway. Volt Switch here would actually deal a decent amount of damage to me, but for some reason, the Zebstrika chooses to not use it, and just falls to two rock slides. That was pretty simple. Flaffy comes out next, and almost dies to two more rock slides, but survives and paralyzes me. I briefly consider swapping here, but I think Lil Rock can finish the battle all on her own. Flaffy heals, but then falls in just a few more hits. The Squirrel makes a return, only to die in a single rock slide. 
I didn't realize just how much of a tank Lil Rock with an Eviolite would actually end up being, but she completely rocked it. With our fourth badge, we are now halfway to the Elite Four, and things are going pretty well, considering that, again, Bug-type Pokemon are not the greatest. But as I try to leave the gym, Alessa and her posse surround me and force me to walk down in front of this crowd as they catcall me. I didn't sign up for this, and now I just feel dirty inside. I try to leave this place behind, but wouldn't you know that Team Plasma shows up again for some more bad guy stuff. Who cares? Once I can finally leave, there's a biker blocking my path. Who wants to do a triple battle? But he didn't tell me his name enough times, so I forgot what it was. Now, I didn't actually pay attention when he was talking, because he said triple battle, but I assumed it was a rotation battle. Nope. I really need to be more aware of what people are saying to me. No matter. I quickly defeat this heartbreaker, because I'm just that good, and cross the Driftvale Drawbridge, which is a very difficult phrase for me to say. I had to record this sentence like five times before I finally got it right, and I probably still messed it up because that's just how it goes. In the Driftvale market, I'm having a good time just window shopping, buying some stuff, when the Heartbreaker Charles strikes again. Forget Nike, TM. This guy is my new rival. And, speaking of, this criminal is just hanging around outside the market as if he did nothing wrong and now he does want a rotation battle. All right, I trounce my new rival and obviously break his heart. Before doing some more story stuff in Driftvale, I take a bit of a detour to Chargestone Cave to get myself a Joltik, who I name Electabug. And then I find a Carablast on Route 6, who I name Lisnail. That name will make a lot more sense once he evolves. I get some free items in a few of the hotels and then find the so-called good team plasma guys who force me to fight to enter their home? I ask you, is that how good guys actually act? I think not. I beat him easily enough, gain access to his domicile, and only partly listen to his sob story of how they used to be Pokemon thieves, but not anymore. Okay, whatever. The real kicker is that this rude tries to give me a Zora, which I still can't pronounce, which I have to decline because he's not a bug. But that offer would have been very useful in my last run, where I used only dark Pokemon. Whatever. With that out of the way, it's time to fight Clay. I'm not a big fan of my strategy here, but I couldn't really think of anything else. His Croc Rocks Intimidate is cancelled by Big Claw's Hypercutter, so that's nice at least. I use Swords Dance, expecting a strong crunch in return. Instead, he lowers my speed, which really sucks, because now, his Exodrill will 100% outspeed me and just take me out. So Big Claw is probably going to die here. The Crocorock falls to an Excisor, bringing out Exodrill who can kill with a critical Rock Slide. So I hope that he doesn't crit or I don't get flinched, and then he uses Slash instead. That works for me. One Brick Break is all I need to knock him out, and now I basically have this victory in the back. I mean, the Sand Slash does outspeed me, but he misses anyway, and then dies in one hit, winning me the battle. I spent so much time trying to figure out how to get around his Exodrill's Rock Slide, and he didn't even use it? He could easily have wiped my entire team, but nope. Do you guys have any idea why he chose to use Slash instead? Because I have nothing. I thought I had the AI figured out, and apparently not. I'm then forced to enter a Pokemon World Tournament against my will, and to show my unwillingness to be here, I beat everybody using just Big Claw. I'm starting to really like this girl. Before this run, I had some preconceived biases about pincers that I'll get into more detail later. Let's just say it was very entomophobic. And for my incredible victory, my stunning glory, I win one whole battle point. That was worth it. Charon, Nike, and I then board a suspicious looking boat that turns out to be a plasma trap. And even in this life or death situation, Nike still manages to throw shade at these plasma guys. All right, you won. You can be my rival again. After kicking some plasma butt, using Big Claw almost exclusively because she is just fan freaking tastic, the head honcho shows up, who Charon inexplicably remembers from that single meeting two years ago. It's been like two months for me, and I've already forgotten all about Zinzolini. These ninjas show up and magically teleport us off the boat. It was at least nice of them to bring us to the dock and not drop us in the ocean. Jumping ahead a bit, Lil Rock starts to evolve. And I briefly consider stopping this evolution so I can keep using an Eviolite, but nature finds a way. 
Who am I to hinder progress? I find a firebug, just kinda chilling in an underground temple, who I thankfully catch in the first Ultra Ball, because Lil Rock couldn't handle much more of this fight after getting burned. I name the newly caught Volcarona Hot Dog. In Mistleton City, I meet Professor Juniper for the very first time, who just gives me a Master Ball for no reason. Is this how she greets all the guys, or am I just special? Skyla interrupts our riveting conversation to suggest that I go to the Celestial Tower to train. Oh no you don't. I'm not falling for that one again. Instead, I head to the gym with a newly evolved Electabug, who, with the help of an expert belt, one-shots every trainer's Pokemon leading up to Skyla. Man, getting this badge is gonna be a breeze. Get it? Skyla? A breeze? No? Maybe it just flew over your head. Lame jokes aside, Electabug does one-shot the Swoobat, and unsurprisingly, Perswana suffers the same fate. The Skarmory does survive a hit because of Sturdy, but does almost nothing with Steel Wing. It's sad, really, how weak that was. As gym leaders tend to do, she stalls a bit with healing, but there's no way she can come back and win. A few more hits, and my bugs, or more accurately, a single bug, has taken out his predators. With another badge in hand, we jet to Celestial Tower, because I'm forced to go there anyway. That sucks. But I only really have to enter the lobby area so I can find and talk to Professor Juniper. As I leave the tower, I accidentally run into this girl who starts a triple battle with three birds. I was pretty concerned at the beginning, and then Electabug takes out two of these birds with one single attack, and LB and lots of legs gang up on the last duck. Just like Skyla, those birds weren't scary at all. With that, Bianca, Juniper, and I jump on Skyla's plane and fly to Lentil's Town, where Professor Juniper drops a ton of exposition, like a buttload of exposition. Eventually, Bianca just can't handle it, and she books it, followed shortly by me. Bianca accompanies me as I travel through Reversal Mountain. It's not the other way around, as she would have you believe. Now technically, there is one viable encounter in this area, and that is Scorapy, but since he loses his almighty bugness upon evolving, he's dead to me. After leaving poor Bianca in a cave all by herself, I get to Undela Town, where I run into Nike. It's been a while since we fought, so I guess we're due for a bout. He leads with Un Pheasant, so I lead with my Bird Killer. The Bird delays the inevitable with a Detect, but then dies next turn. His Ace, Embor, immediately comes out, and I swap to Lil Rock on a critical takedown. I use Shell Smash to outspeed next turn, as Embor starts to roll out. Thankfully, I came prepared with Protect, though I did think that Lil Rock had leftovers too, I don't know why he doesn't. Still, after missing my first Rock Slide, and having to Protect again, I flinch the Embor, and after a heal, take it out with a few more hits. Out comes the Water Monkey, so LB takes a turn to tank a Scald, which doesn't burn, thankfully, and one-shots the Depressed Monkey with a Leaf Blade. Not too shabby. It seems a bit weird that my rival only has three Pokemon after Gym 6, but whatever. On Route 13, I find a goat-looking Pokemon that is clearly not a bug, so I'm sure he sucks anyway. In Lacunosa Town, Nike, TM, and I find more Plasma Guys, who are actually kind enough to wait for me to be ready before trying to kick my butt. Since I haven't shown any Plasma fight so far, I'll just let this one play out, because why not? This is a double battle with Nike. I start with Lil Rock, as Embor uses Flamethrower, which is nice, but he hits the Golbat instead of the Snowflake for some reason, and then I miss everybody with Rock Slide. That sucks. After getting hit by an Ice Beam, Embor takes out the Golbat, and Rock Slide does connect to squash the Snowflake. This brings out Sneasel and Garbodor as Nike heals, I get poisoned, and deal a decent amount with another Rock Slide. I swap to Big Claw, who's probably my favorite team member right now, to help finish off the fight. Embor actually did a decent amount of damage here. It can be hit or miss for AI double battles, but he did a good job. And because I apparently had nothing else to do for an hour, I search Rustling Grass until I eventually find a Vespiqueen who I don't really end up using. I name her B-King. Continuing on, I encounter this guy who wants to hit a 1000 win streak, and I naively assume he'll be simple to beat. So I start with Lil Rock, which I immediately realize was a mistake, and swap to Big Claw on a crunch. After dealing a bit of damage with Brick Break, I realize that I could easily die here. So it's time for Hot Dog to come out, even though the only fire move she knows is Fire Spin. Not great. It is enough to take out the Metal Ant, and Lucario comes out to replace him. 
After two fire spins, I have defeated this guy's streak and ruined his life, but as you can probably tell, I wasn't ready for that fight, so I'm really lucky it didn't end up poorly. This is what happens when you Nuzlocke games that you've never played before. Things come up that surprise you, even as you're reading the walkthrough. On Route 11, I find another big legendary thing, who's also not a bug. So, instead, I search for the far superior Shelmet. I name him Ninbug, but will never use him in this run. The only reason I wanted this guy was so that I could evolve the Snail using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, which allows him to evolve as long as you have a Shelmet on the team. And this guy I will use a ton, starting with the seventh gym in Dragon City. Now Drayden is actually concerning because a lot of his dragons can deal a ton of damage to my bugs, with the exception of Le Snail. He leads with Drudigan as Le Snail uses Iron Defense and heals a bit with Leftovers. Now Crunch does almost nothing, and after two Iron Heads, the first dragon dies, as I get fully healed. This brings out Flygon, who does a decent amount with Earth Power, but I do way more with Iron Head. Next turn, I go first, meaning he was trying to use Dragon Tail, but never gets a chance. Next is Haxorus, who heals the Iron Head with a berry, and does manage to hit a Dragon Tail, dragging out LB. And I don't particularly like that, so I immediately swap back to the Snail on a Dragon Dance. He uses another Dragon Dance, which is getting unfortunate, but dies to one more Iron Head. I know that fight didn't look difficult, but Flygon's Rock Slide could have easily killed all of my Pokemon besides the Snail and maybe Lil Rock. I actually did consider only bringing the Snail for this fight, so Dragon Tail wouldn't have swapped him out with someone else. I was that confident that he would win. But in the off chance they got several crits in a row, I didn't really want to risk losing the run this far in the game. And for my legendary victory, I get the Legend Badge. As a reward for my victory, I get to listen to Drayden blab on and on about dragons being cut in half or something like that. I don't know, I kinda zoned out. Eventually though, Team Plasma comes to the rescue with their flying ship, and it shoots ice magically. After running around the city for a good long while, trying to find and defeat every Plasma member, I find Zinzolini now snooping in the gym. So I decide to kick his butt. It ends up being a very simple fight though. Big Claw and the Snail just come in and one-shot his entire team, with the exception of being confused. After defeating him, Drayden comes up and immediately brings out the very item that they've been looking for, like an idiot. I've never played this game before, and even I knew they were hiding, waiting for stupid Drayden to do exactly that. Great job, man. Now I have even more work to do. I try to continue my journey, but encounter an unexpected roadblock. Someone had the bright idea to test a bridge's weight capacity using real people. That seems like a lawsuit waiting to happen. Backtracking a bit, I get to the Umalau gym, ride a Splash Mountain wannabe, and begin the last gym battle. He starts with Karakosta, who survives a Miracle Seed Leaf Blade, because he has Sturdy, and uses Shell Smash. Even with that speed boost though, LB is faster, and after two more Leaf Blades, the fake Blastoise goes down. This brings out the Giant Whale, who has a ton of HP, but not that much defense. So he dies too. Jellicent is next, and last, and still falls to a single hit, winning me the eighth and last Gym Badge. Wow. That was almost embarrassingly easy. At this point, I'm thinking to myself that this run has been a lot easier than I thought it would be, especially with a bug team. But I probably just jinxed myself, didn't I? After the battle, Marlin just plops into the ocean like it's no big deal. I surf to the seaside cave, and after searching for a while, I eventually find my last encounter of the run, a Shuckle, who is one of my favorite bugs. I name her Shucky, because I have to, Though I did omit the C on purpose, mainly because I forgot to put it in. I get to the docked plasma ship and wreck everybody on board, including Zinzolini and a random plasma grunt yet again. Though this time, Hot Dog leads the charge and just destroys everybody with Heat Wave. It's nice to have a fire move other than Fire Spin for a change. In spite of my clear victory, I am once again marooned as the boat flies off into the sky, this time with water jetpacks. This forces me to find and board the boat for a third time. I once again defeat everyone on board, and once again have to fight Zinzolini, who has the same team I just defeated, 
though very slightly stronger, I guess. I mix things up a bit and lead with Le Snail, who is immediately confused. Oh well. After taking an Ice Beam, his Snowflake goes down in one hit, bringing out the second, almost identical Snowflake, who also gets crushed by an Iron Head. Last is Weavile, who, you guessed it, also dies in one hit. If you're going to make me fight the same guy three times in like an hour, at least give them different Pokemon or something. This is just getting boring at this point. We immediately have another fight, this time against Coltress. He favors Steel types, so I lead with Hot Dog. I guess I temporarily forgot that Magneton has Sturdy, because it 100% should have Levitate, meaning it doesn't die in one hit. This mistake causes me to be paralyzed, which is just perfect, and I take a Volt Switch. On the upside, I get to one-shot the Matang, so that's nice. Against the Magnezone, I swap to the Snail to tank a Flash Cannon and get paralyzed by a Discharge, before lowering his defense with a Rock Smash. I stall a bit to get some healing and lower his defense yet again, but now I risk dying. So LB makes an appearance as he explodes. Thankfully, LB survives, but I really should have expected that and swapped to Lil Rock instead. This fight is not going well so far. It's time to bring in the big guns, or claws, actually. After shifting gears a few times, the Kling Klang dies to a single superpower, bringing out the Beamon, who survives an Excisor because of my attack drop, but does less than half to me. After one more hit, he falls. Last is the Magneton, once again, but since I outspeed and it has literally one HP left, there's nothing he can do to me. And I win. That was a bit of a roller coaster ride, and I can't believe I salvaged it from the horrible start that I had. We still have a deathless run. For now. At this point, I have to defeat the Shadow Triad, but Big Claw, with an Expert Belt, single-handedly one-shots all of their Pokemon. I can't believe I used to dislike Pinsa. What was wrong with me? Jumping ahead to a cave, I find that Gestus is the real mastermind behind Team Plasma. What a surprise. No one could have ever guessed that. After his dragon fails to kill me, and absorbs N's dragon in a relatively long cutscene, I need to defeat it, because Gestus' staff apparently stops Pokeballs from working even though I can still send out and return Pokemon. Doesn't make a ton of sense, but that's the way it goes. Okay, a Focus Sash Big Claw gets a lucky critical hit, knocking out the dragon in one hit. Easy peasy. Next is Gestus. I couldn't swap my team around, but against his Cough Egregious, I just pivot to Lesnail immediately to avoid a Toxic, so it's fine. Iron Head should be a three hit KO with his leftovers, and his Shadow Ball does basically nothing to me. He does heal at one point, but again, he can't do any real damage, so I'm glad that he wasted a healing item here. When the ghost passes on to the afterlife, Electros is baited out, who threatens with a four times effective flamethrower. So, naturally, I swapped a hot dog on an acrobatics? Are you kidding me? Thankfully it didn't crit, but now my whole plan is kinda shot. Because I have this low HP, I have no idea what move he's going to use next so I can't safely pivot to anybody. I decide to swap to lots of legs on another acrobatics, I was afraid of that, and now it seems clear to me that he's going to die. I'd rather lose him than almost anyone else on the team. Sorry man. I hit a Venishock that does basically no damage, but at least Poison Point activates as my Centipede dies. Okay, we don't have a Deathless run anymore, that's too bad. At this HP, I'm confident that LB can finish it off with a Miracle Seed Leaf Blade. But apparently not. And now he chooses to use Flamethrower. Come on, man. Just like that, my first two Pokemon have fallen to a stupid eel, simply because I apparently couldn't predict his moves. At least, the eel then dies from poison. I bring out the safest bet, which is the Snail, and out comes Seismitoad. His Earthquake doesn't do too much, but neither does my Iron Head. So after stalling a turn, I swap to my Ace, Big Claw, who tanks an Earthquake like nothing, and kills with Excisor, because of course she does. Against Hydreigon, I pivot back to the Snail on a Rock Slide, stall for some leftovers healing, and take it out with a single Excisor. Next is Drapion, but after a few Protects and Iron Heads, the Snail is victorious. Though he still does have a Toxicroak who threatens with Brick Break. So I swapped to Big Claw and then realized I don't have any good moves against this guy. 
I hit a pretty weak brick break and get hit pretty hard with Toxic Jab, so I retreat to a Snail again. After stalling, yet again, an Iron Hand does a ton of damage. Way more than I thought. I never should have swapped the Snail out. Why did I doubt him? After one more brick break, I kill the Croak. Okay, so it may seem like a really small thing, but that stupid Electros not using Flamethrower was pretty crappy and put me completely off my game. Thankfully, against most of his Pokemon, the Snail could simply come out, stall, and kill. But I'm still really frustrated about the entire ordeal that caused me to lose my first two Pokemon of the run. If you have any idea why he didn't use a four times effective Flamethrower and instead opted to use a neutral Acrobatics, let me know because I've got nothing. With Gestus' plans ruined, yet again, we have saved the world. This guy then gets kidnapped by his very own Shadow Triad. You know you done messed up when your own people turn against you. With that out of the way, we can finally get to the end of the journey, the Elite Four. After putting LB and lots of legs into the dead box. Goodbye my friends, you will be missed. And after, once again, talking to the Metal Man. I keep forgetting who he is, and I think he has something important to give me or tell me, but yeah, this one takes a while. Victory Road is a bit of a challenge, but I get through relatively unscathed, and I'm ready to fight Nike TM for the very last time. He starts with his bird, and I use a Choice Specs hot dog to cook it like a chicken. This baits out Simpor, who uses Rock Slide, but I swap to the Snail and tank it. Surf does more to me than I thought, but with a bit of leftover stalling, I take out the depressed water monkey and two X scissors. This baits out Embor, who I assume will use Flamethrower, but I've been wrong about that in the past, so who knows. I try my luck with Hot Dog, who does take a Flamethrower pretty well, and one shots with Psychic. Against Buffalant, I pivot to a Focus Sash Big Claw, who kills the buffalo with a single superpower. Winning me my last rival fight, and getting me Thunderbolt which is super late in the game, but thanks anyway, I guess. I will use it a single time. Now it's on to the Pokemon League, but for real this time. I tell myself the order doesn't matter and go to fight Chantal first, which wasn't a very smart move, as you'll see in a second. I start with Hot Dog, who uses a Choice Specs boosted flamethrower to one-shot the Coffin Ghost. This baits out Chandelure, who is by far the scariest Pokemon in the entire Elite Four for my team. Her Fire Blast could easily one-shot all of my Pokemon, with the exception of Shucky. So, it's time for Shucky to shine. I come in on a Fire Blast, and just need to survive 5 Fire Blast hits. I protect, and then don't get a Fire Blast crit, and use Power Split. Now this creepy Chandelure is not nearly as scary. You see, Power Split averages the user's and the target's attack, but since Shucky has basically zero attack, it effectively cuts my opponent's attacks in half. One benefit of this, as opposed to stat boosting moves or stat lowering, is that a crit doesn't bypass the change. Meaning, I survive a Fire Blast at 12 HP and use Rest. After running out of Fire Blast PP, Chandelure swaps to Shadow Ball, which immediately lowers my special defense. That's not great, but it's okay. After waking up, I swap between Protect and Rock Slide to deal some damage, and then pivot to Little Rock on a Shadow Ball that, of course, just so happens to crit. I won't survive another crit, so out comes Electabug with Focus Sash to finally take out the Chandelure. The Gorlurk threatens an Earthquake, so I bring out Big Claw, who takes it really well. And this lets me pivot back to Hot Dog on a Shadow Punch that actually does a lot more than I thought it would, but still a lot less than Earthquake would have. This lets me take out the Golark with a Flamethrower, and then I do the same thing for the Drift Bloom. Now, even though nobody died here, that very easily could have happened against the Chandelure. So it would have been smart for me to save this fight for the very end, but oh well. Things turned out okay, and since Chucky did survive, I want to see how else I can use her in these fights. Next, I decide to go fight Marshall and leave with Le Snail. An Iron Head deals a decent chunk of damage to his throw, who slows me down with Bulldoze, which is unfortunate. He heals after another Iron Head, and does take out a good chunk of my HP before falling to a few more Iron Heads. He was using Storm Throw, which always crits, so an Iron Defense wouldn't have done anything to help. Next is his Mind Shell, but I have a plan. I use Protect, which causes him to get hurt by High Jump Kick, pivot to Shucky on another kick, 
who then uses Protect, allowing the fighting cat thing to kill itself. Nice! I simply used his own momentum against him. That's called karate, or something, I have no idea. Out comes the Conkledor. So Hot Dog, with the choice specs, kills it with a Psychic. Last is Sock, who has Sturdy, which is really unfortunate. So Shucky comes back out to avoid a Rock Slide, that was pretty lucky, protects, and power splits once again. After stealing half of his attack, Rock Slide now does very little to me, but it still can make me flinch. I swap to La Snail, who tanks a Rock Slide, and then immediately pivot to Hot Dog, who tanks a Brick Break, to finish off the fight with one more Psychic. Man, our newest team member Shucky is really doing a great job. It may be only support, but it's pretty great support if you ask me. Now it's on to Caitlyn, which is a very simple fight. I leave with Big Claw, who takes out the Musharna in one expert belted hit. Against the Sigilglyph, I swap to a Focus Sash Electabug to survive an Air Slash and one shots the thing with Thunderbolt. Okay, I guess I used Thunderbolt twice in this run. Against her Ranunculus, whatever that is, the Snail makes an appearance on a Psychic, but baits out a Focus Blast, allowing me to safely swap back to Big Claw because it does a lot less than Psychic would have. Big Claw kills with an X Scissor, and then does the same thing to the Gothitelle. She levels up here, which will be crucial for the champion fight, but more on that later. First, it's time for Grimsley, the last Elite Four member. He starts with Leopard against my Snail. Even though it won't do any real damage, I protect against Fake Out to show Grimsley that I can read him like a book. Psychological warfare, man. The Snail then falls in love with a cat, but after one turn, he realizes that their love will never work. They're just two very different Pokemon, and the cat falls to an X-Scissor. The Crocodile intimidates the heartbroken snail, but Big Claw steps up to tank an earthquake and kill with her own expert belted X-Scissor. The Bisharp is sent out, and just as quickly, is sent back. Last is Scrafty, who dies to a superpower. It was crit, but that wasn't necessary. And just like that, we've beaten the entire Elite Four. As I said at the start, Chantelle was by far the most concerning, so I should have saved her for last. But once she was out of the way, it was pretty smooth sailing from there. Now it's on to the champion, who lives in this freaking huge palace, that this time is not overshadowed by an even bigger castle. And so, we begin the last fight of the run. It's time to show how awesome Big Claw can actually be. Iris leads with Hydreigon, who is outsped, and falls to a single X Scissor, as Big Claw levels up again. Next is Drudigan, who threatens with a pretty strong Rock Slide, but Big Claw, who has a Focus Sash, just uses Swords Dance. With a two times boosted attack, an X Scissor is all I need. Out comes the Archaeops, but since the start of the Elite Four, Big Claw has had an experienced share when she wasn't participating in the battle. That way, she could get to level 60 and be just barely faster than this rock bird, who dies to a single superpower. Even with that attack drop though, I'm still at plus one. For the Agron, a four times effective Brick Break is more than enough. This brings out Lapras, who would survive a Brick Break, but not a superpower. Unfortunately, this is as far as Big Claw goes. With minus two defense, the Haxorus could easily take her out. But she's done such a great job that I can't bring myself to sacrifice her. She deserves a real rest. Instead, I swap to Shucky, who tanks an X-Scissor and then an Earthquake, before, surprise surprise, using another Power Split. I'm really starting to like this move, in case you couldn't tell. At this point, I want Chucky to defeat the Haxorus all on her own, because that would be awesome, and it seems doable with how little Earthquake is doing to me, until Haxorus starts using Dragon Dance. Now things are getting a bit scary. After some quick thinking, I pivot to La Snail as Haxorus gets two more Dragon Dances, but then falls to a single critical Iron Head. That could have easily spiraled out of control, but La Snail, as always, came in clutch and made sure I didn't lose. In the end, my team of bugs defeated the champion's dragons, and her other non-dragon Pokemon too, I guess. And now it's time to bear my soul. My entire life, I have been bigoted against pincers. I hate to say it, but it's true. You see, when I was a wee lad, back in the day, I got the original red version. So naturally, 
I was convinced that Scyther was better than Pinsir and Electabuzz better than Magmar. This erroneous opinion continued when I bought Fire Red instead of Leaf Green. Literally my entire life, I've disliked Pinsir, and it's not until actually using one in this run that I've realized how irrational my feelings actually were. So the moral of the story is to never judge a bug by its cover, or never judge version exclusive Pokemon based on the other version exclusive Pokemon. Get to know them first. This bug run actually went surprisingly well, and aside from a few key misplays, I think I did a decent job here. If you agree, make sure to let me know, and maybe share it on social media with people who might like it too. Thank you so much for watching.